vagina is a shell. <laughs> a round, pink, tender shell. Opening and closing. Closing and opening. My vagina is a flower. An eccentric tulip. Its center, acute and deep. Its scent, delicate. Its petals, gentle but sturdy. <laughs> I did not always know this. I learned this at the vagina workshop. I learned this from the woman who taught the vagina workshop, who really believes in vaginas. She really sees vaginas. She helps other women see their own vaginas by seeing other women's vaginas. In the first session, the woman who ran the workshop asked us to draw our own unique Beautiful, fabulous vaginas. <laughs> That's what she called them. She wanted us to draw our own unique, beautiful, fabulous vaginas because she wanted to know what they looked like to us. One woman who was pregnant drew a huge red mouth, screaming and spilling out coins. <laughs> Another woman who was very skinny drew a huge serving platter with a kind of Devonshire pattern on it. I drew a huge black dot <laughs> with little squiggly lines around it. The black dot was equal to a black hole in space, and the little squiggly lines meant to be people or objects or just random basic items I got lost in there. <laughs> I've always thought of my vagina as an anatomical vacuum, just like random, like sucking up particles in the surrounding environment. <laughs> I never really thought of my vagina in practical or biological terms. For example, I really never thought of my vagina as something attached to me. In the session, we were asked to look at our vaginas using hand mirrors. Then after careful inspection, we were to report back to the rest of the group that we had found. I must tell you that up until this point, everything I knew about my vagina was based off of hearsay or invention. I never really seen the thing. It never really occurred to me to look at it. My vagina existed for me on like an abstract plane. It just seemed so reductive and awkward. Like, here we are on our mats with our hand mirrors. It must have been our early astronomers who have felt with their primitive telescopes. I found it quite unsettling at first, my vagina. Like, the first time you cut open a fish and you see this other bloody, complex world inside, right under the skin. It was just so raw, <laughs> so red, so fresh. And what surprised me the most was all of the layers, layers inside layers, opening into more layers. I mean, my vagina amazed me. I couldn't speak when it came in my turn in the workshop. I was speechless. I'd awakened to what the woman here in the workshop called vaginal wonder. <laughs> I just wanted to lay there on my little blue mat, legs spread, examining my vagina forever. I mean, it was better than the Grand Canyon, like ancient and full of grace. It had the freshness and innocence of a proper English garden. And it was funny, like very funny, it made me laugh. We played hide and seek, like opening and closing. <laughs> and then the woman who ran the workshop had asked us, how many of us had had orgasms? <laughs> Two women tentatively raised their hands. I did not raise my hand, even though I had had orgasms. I didn't raise my hand because they've only ever been accidental orgasms. They happened to me. They would happen in my dreams, and I like in splendor. They happen in water, mostly in the bath. Once in Cape Cod, they would happen on horses, and on bicycles, and even on the schedule at the gym. I didn't raise my hand because even though I had orgasms, I didn't know how to make one happen. It was just like this magical, mystical thing. I didn't want to interfere. It felt wrong getting involved, like contrived, manipulative. It felt Hollywood. <laughs> the magic would be gone, and the mystery 
Of course, the problem was I hadn't had I hadn't had a magical mystical orgasm in two years. I hadn't had an orgasm in a long time, and I was frantic. That's why I went to the workshop. And then the moment had arrived that I both dreaded and longed for. The woman who ran the workshop asked us to take out our hand mirrors again and to see if we could locate our clitoris. So there we were, the group of us women on our backs, on our backs, <laughs> searching for our spots, our locus, our reason. And I don't know why, but I started crying. <laughs> Maybe it was sheer embarrassment. Maybe it was from knowing I had to give up the fantasy, you know, the enormous life-consuming fantasy that someone or something was going to come and do this for me, the fantasy that someone was coming to lead my life, to feel the panic coming in, the simultaneous terror and realization that I had avoided finding my clitoris and had rationalized it as mainstream and consumerist because I was, in fact, terrified that I didn't have a clitoris. Terrified that I'm one of those constitutionally <laughs> incapable, one of those frigid, dead, shut down, dry, apricot tasting, bitter. <sighs> my God. <laughs> so I lay there on my mat, searching with my finger, trying to find my spot, and I couldn't find it. All I could think about was that time when I was 10 and I lost my gold ring with the emeralds in the lake, and I kept diving in over and over, running my hands over stones and fish and bottle caps and slimy stuff, but never my ring. <sighs> the panic I felt, I, I knew I'd be punished. So the woman here in the workshop saw my insane scrambling, heavy breathing, sweating. <laughs> she came over and I just blurted out, I lost it, it's gone, it's gone. I lost it, <laughs> I lost it. I shouldn't have worn a swimming. <laughs> my forehead. <laughs> and she told me my, clitor my clitoris was something that I could not lose. It was me, she said, the essence of me. It was both the doorbell to my house and the house itself. I didn't have to find it, I had to be it. <laughs> be it. Be my clitoris. Be my clitoris. So I lay back, I closed my eyes, I put my hand mirror down, and I watched myself floating above myself. I watched as I slowly began to approach myself and re-enter. I felt like an astronaut trying to re-enter the surface of the Earth. It was very quiet, this re-entry, quiet but gentle. I bounced and landed, landed and bounced. I came into my own muscles and blood and cells, and I slid into my vagina. It was suddenly easy, and I fit. I became all warm and pulsing and ready and young and alive. And then I touched what had suddenly become me. There was a little quivering at first, which urged me to stay, and then that quivering became a quake. And eruption, the layers dividing and subdividing, and this quake broke open onto an ancient horizon of light and silence, which then opened onto a plane of music and colors and innocence and longing, and I felt connection, calling connection. My vagina is a shell, a tulip, and a destiny. I am arriving as I am beginning to leave. My vagina. My vagina! <laughs> <laughs>